Hello everyone. We're just waiting for a couple more people to come in. If you're just tuning in now, please feel free to drop in where you're tuning in from. We're just waiting a couple of minutes for people to come in. Hi, Paisy. Arkansas, oh wow. Hi, Malia. Seeing a couple more people tuning in. Wales, oh hello. We have a global reach today. <laughs> yes we have london we have a couple people coming in as well once our partner is able to tune in we'll start the talk in okay indiana london all right perfect i think we're in hi hi how are you i'm well how are you doing good we were just asking our audience where they're tuning in from and we have a couple of people from london i see scotland indiana um but we have a lot of people here from all over New York, uh, which is where I'm from. So it's really nice to see everybody that's able to tune in. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm also checking in from Nashville. So we're in a, we're splitting the time difference here and we are snowed in in here as well. Yes, yeah, so we just <laughs> see that the South is getting hit with a big snowstorm. Yeah, and everyone is flipping. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of crazy things happening, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But um, I'm really happy to have you on this live and for us to have this conversation, especially as we're observing Black History Month, to really discuss this important topic about prison slavery. Mm -hmm. um, who are tuning in just before we get started, if you have any questions, feel free to drop in any questions on the comments or where the question mark is at the bottom so it's easier for me to shift through um, and answer if you any, any of your questions. Um, so just to kick off, I'll introduce myself. My name is Harana Adisu. I am the Advocacy Officer for Freedom United. Freedom United is one of the largest organizations that dedicated to eradicating human, human trafficking and modern day slavery, including forced labor. And we are able to do this with our global petition. Um, as many of us know, the 13th Amendment, slavery was abolished. But what many people fail to understand and that little loophole that's included in that legislation is that prison slavery can be, slavery can be used as a tool for um, punishment. Um, and this loophole has created vast human rights violations that has left a lot of people who are Black Brown in a system where they are being exploited for their labor. Um, that's why with Freedom United, we launched a campaign calling for all sectors, public and private, to divest from the system unless individuals are being paid prevailing and proper wages. Mm -hmm. And one thing to um, one thing to echo is our campaign is calling for proper wages. So we do want um, those who are incarcerated to have the opportunity for employment, but it should never come to the expense of exploitation and them being paid pennies. Um, this exploitative um, system has not only impacted those who are incarcerated, but has also seeped into the immigration detention centers where migrants are being coerced and forced into labor and not being 
paid properly. Um, and that's why we've teamed up with Be Better Belmont, um, asking for the University Belmont University Divest from Core Civic. Um, and I'll leave this to Safara, our partner, to give a little bit of introduction to herself and to give us a background context of the campaign as well. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Harana, for having myself and just for, my, for myself to represent Be Better Belmont. I really appreciate the platform and appreciate the work that y'all do um, and happy to be on this campaign. And so I'm a member of Be Better Belmont. Um, I li currently live in Nashville where Belmont University resides. Um, we have been a formal group for about, oh, wow, it's been like almost, it's been about eight months now. Um, we have a formal letter of demands that um, is calling on a ma many things for Belmont to do, but predominantly to divest away from Core Civic, which is the largest private prison uh, corporation in the U.S. Um, the CEO, Damon Heininger, sits on our board of trustees. They also have an endowment fund to us um, for a number of years. Some of our founding or some of the founding investors of Core Civic are have also been on the board of trustees for Belmont at multiple different times. They've also invested directly into Belmont University for some of their founding buildings, some of their programs. Mm -hmm. It's all interwoven. Mm -hmm. um, we're also calling for anti-racism work to be implemented for measurable accountability, transparency and accountability for the um, actual university to be honest about their history, which has uh, just about 100 plus years of 120 years worth of uh, slavery involvement. Um, they have the mansion that sits on the on the um, university is was built by black and brown people enslaved people. Um, they the owners of the mansion were slave traders. That's how they got their money. They own plantations in Tennessee and Louisiana, all these things. So we're calling for anti-racism anti -racism work to be implemented in the university, full divestment, uh, monetary and systematically from the, uh, from the university as well. And um, for those who are tuning in as well, we'll be dissecting a lot of our campaign on, and a lot of the topics we touched on um, throughout the talks. Questions again, feel free to drop in um, on the tab below. Um, so, before we dive in a little bit, um, for those who are tuning in, this might be time talking about prison slavery or understanding what it actually means. Um, so, can you explain to our audience uh, what does prison slavery mean and how it's still legal um, to this day and age? Yeah, so prison slavery um, has really existed. It's just, it's it existed when the first boat came over with people on it um, to work on plantations. That is slavery. That's enslavement. Um, but to be to our more modern version of slavery um, through the prison industrial complex, that was made, um, like you said earlier, made legal through the 13th Amendment. That was supposed to be an abolition of slavery, um, but it isn't full abolition. And while a lot of people call it a loophole, I... I personally believe that it was intentional um, because enslavement labor has been used to build um, like railroad systems. It was built, it was built to um, do very menial work where it was through sewage systems or, or whatever menial work that existed. Um, and so through the 13th amendment, it says that um, all, per all enslavement traditional views of, or traditional uses of enslavement um, are now abolished unless it is through punishment of a crime. Um, and that is explicit, that isn't a loophole, it's just a, a pure statement. Um, and so what happens then is um, capitalism or any kind of, um, exploitative nature through somebody who is in imprisoned uh that that's where we find the intersection that's where we so when capitalism is involved in imprisonment that is where we find the prison industrial complex that is when we find the um profitization off of uh people that are imprisoned which is just enslavement <laughs> and i think that's really important to say loophole because even myself i can i i said loophole at first but it is, and it was an intentional writing in in the in the, the amendment that it was mm -hmm. utilized as a tool of punishment, um, and I think that's one way that we've also been speaking about how in international standards that slavery should not be legal. Mm -hmm. um, 
still have it in the United States, which contradicts what we stand for um, theoretically on the human rights standards. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned under legal laws now, it's legal to use forced labor as a punishment. Um, how does, and then we touched on it a little bit, but how does this tie into historical slavery and how does this heavily impact black, the black and brown community and people that look like us? Yeah, I mean, so I want to also say that uh, I am 23. I am not a professional in this career. Um, this is something that I feel impassioned by. And I want to acknowledge that there are dozens and generations and long lineage of black and brown people that have been doing abolition work and education for who even know probably since the first boat hit the ground. Um, and so I don't want to like take the frame that I know everything, but um, so to call upon different like historical factors of um, prison enslavement uh, in the prison industrial complex. So with that, um, with that amendment, how it affects black and brown people is that they are seen as something they are seen as dollar signs it isn't seen as people because all we have known up to this point and when i say we i mean back in the 1800s when this amendment was written uh they only saw black people as slaves and so this is happening at the same time that eugenics are kind of coming into terms and racial hierarchies are coming into terms in a very like scientific and systematic way so when you, in the history of eugenics, if your family has been traditionally been enslaved, or if your family are criminals or whatever, insert poor representation here, uh, then you are destined to be those things. So what happens is there's over-policing. We see uh, police, whether it be traditional police through like this, through the state government or the city government, or it's literally just white people or anybody who sees themselves as higher than these black, brown, or impoverished people um, are over-policing uh, these groups of people to where they are um, vulnerable to being exploited. Um, and so you see this through, I mean, again, I could talk about this alone for probably hours and hours and hours. So to make it more concise, we see a uh, we see slums being created for black people to live. We take we see the um, forty acres and a mule law taken away so that black and brown people don't have land anymore, which makes them more susceptible to be on the streets, which makes them more susceptible to being taken into prison or being put into a cell or whatever, which makes them more vulnerable to be exploited for labor because that's what can be done during uh, legally through this system. So. What we've seen over 100 years, 150 years, is um, a continual, almost like a hiding game of how can we make systemic racism feasible in capitalism? How can we continue to hide the fact that this is racism um, by making it pretty and systemic and weaving it into places that you won't see? And I think what trickles down is what you just said about that generational trauma as well that comes into um, modern slavery as it translates to historical slavery. And as you just mentioned as well, under the 13th Amendment, it was written in specifically um, for um, slavery to be realized as punishment. And that feeds exactly back into impacting the Black and Brown community. Um, and oftentimes we think that's a long time ago and it's something that we can't conceptualize that mm -hmm. it, however the system still pertains and that's why black and brown individuals are overrepresented and overly incarcerated um, and i'll add to that slightly of just to kind of uh call upon um like angela davis's are uh, our prisons obsolete which we're, we're actually reading for be better belmont we have this uh, book club that we're doing for this month but um she makes a really there's a chapter that makes a point that if prisons are since they're statistically or strategically placed outside of like city limits where they're very visible um that means that whatever cultural problems that are happening in the city they're now far away so we don't have to deal with them which is just another way of hiding all of finding hiding spots for all of the um exploitation that's happening
for and a lot of um as i was also even doing a lot of research for this campaign for freedom united one of the most chilling things that i think visually was seeing um some of the prisons that were built on plantations and they were run exactly how they were run in the 1800s and they have um there was an article that had flashbacks of the two images and it was genuinely um i wouldn't say shocking but just it just it was it was heavy to see because you could see the lineage so clearly oh um, yeah belmont is actually complicit in that as well uh the there wasn't a prison on the uh university grounds where the mansion is but the original person who felt basically that where the money came from out alicia athlin her husband uh, was a slave trader and was one of the most successful trade slave traders in the u.s at the time and he owned private prisons as well and he put them around where his plantations or different homesteads were um across the south wow yeah it's nuts <laughs> And it, it's so closely connected, and as you piece the historical ties, it, it ties into what we're dealing with um, to present day. And I, one thing that um, you just mentioned, which segues perfectly to our next topic, is how are companies and private industries uh, benefiting from prison slavery in this systemic slavery system we still live in and how are consumers like you myself people who are tuning in tied into the supply chain um and i think this is a perfect opportunity to even speak about what that tie looks like at uh, belmont university to even students yeah um so i mean almost every single person whether they like it or not is a beneficiary of the prison sector, of the private prison sector, of prison labor. Um, companies like Macy's, com companies like JCPenney, companies like Sodexo, companies like Aramark, who like obviously JCPenney, Macy's, all those are, are clothing brands, but um, places like Aramark and Sodexo, Sodexo uh, who is also partnered with Belmont, um, they supply food to schools and they also supply food to like high schools and colleges and all that. But they also supply food to uh, correctional facilities that some of them are, some correctional facilities are rented out to private industries, uh, which that is also a whole rat hole to, <laughs> to, in to uh, research, which is kind of insane. But um, anyways, so food that like Airmark and Sodexo, um, let's take them they have been complicit in finding rat feces, finding mice carcasses, finding different kind of unbelievably disgusting things in their food and in their distribution. And they're feeding those to prisoners. They're feeding them to college students. They're feeding them to whoever is using their supply. And so that's something that students don't see. That's something that uh, we as consumers don't, Un, like we just don't even put that in our thought process because you assume oh this food came from some food supplier that probably got it from some specific cash farm or something and no it's actually being uh created at the bottom line it's using um poor um poor wages going towards either hourly workers or the prison workers that they use um they are then not treating your body correctly um you are forced to have some kind of thing that can be damaging to your body and so it's just that capitalistic m mindset of just like distancing the consumer away from the supply chain um and that's one specific way and then another way that belmont chooses to be quite obvious about is just uh the ceos on our board of trustees <laughs> which isn't really hard to see um, and you know, when our now, well, he's newly announced to be retiring in June, but, um, our current president saying that he stands behind see the CEO, Damon Hinninger calling him a good Christian man, um, and using Christian, Christian ethics to back the, and not make a statement on anything about the actual corporation that is core civic in that they have, they have caused thousands of deaths and thousands of illnesses through COVID. They have caused, uh, or they exploit people on the border. They exploit people in their facilities. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, 
Un unfortunately, we are very unaware of what we are consuming that has touched the prison industrial complex. And I think one thing um, our viewers might also, you mentioned Core Civic, and um, there's other organizations like Core Civic that actually host um, and have facil facilities themselves and run them. So, can you explain a little bit about what? private run facilities look like and how private companies are able to benefit from it because I think a lot of people are aware that, you know the state and the federal level are in charge of the correctional programs and um, incarceration and prison but I think when they see they think maybe private companies can just take force here, but there's a whole other angle of companies actually um, running these facilities so mm -hmm. can you talk a bit about that and what it looks like yeah, um, I will try to keep it very concise uh, because it kind of, there are a lot of avenues in which some of them operate. So I'll speak about Core Civic specifically. So that's what I know the most about. So let me first start with explaining how the difference between public prisons and private prisons. So by nature, public prisons that are owned by state and federal governments, they are, um, intentionally nonprofits. They are inherently nonprofits uh, because they are solely built to house inmates um, and house incarcerated people. Um, while it's in the mind that's in rehabilitation, that's not the goal. That's not really, it's just for harboring essentially. Um, and so private prisons are, um, they, so how Core Civic works and you can find it on their website. They actually, so they just became a public um, trading company on the NASDAQ. And they, um, so what this means is Core Civic originally advertised themselves as a um, real estate venture. Um, so they would appeal to different cities. They would appeal to different um, uh, publicly ran or uh, state ran facilities. And they would pitch to them that, Core Civic building a facility would lower their um, per day rate of inmates. Um, so in a public ran facility, let's say one inmate costs $150 to, to take care of and to harbor for 24 hours. Core Civic would argue that they would be providing all the employment. Um, they would be finding all of the um, guards, all of the foremen, all uh, everything that has to do with a publicly ran facility would be provided in a privately run facility that the state wouldn't have to worry about. And they would work on the bottom line and have, now they have a, a minimum bed, uh, uh, minimum bed, what is it called? It doesn't matter. Um, but they have a specific, they can't have a certain amount of little amount of beds acquired so that they can continue to make money. Um, and so they pitched to the, uh, public sector, Hey, we can do this for at a bottom line of actually a hundred dollars per month or a hundred dollars per day. So how about you contract with us? We will provide the wages and everything and all the staff for these facilities. You don't have to pay as much. We profit off of that and it is now privatized and all of the logistical um, legal or uh, all the logistics um, about public or about safety, about health, about all these things of the inmates and rehabilitation of the inmates is now in our care. Um, and so they would pitch originally pitch that as a real estate venture, not a uh, correctional facility venture or something like that. Um, and then now it's more modernized to the sense that it's um, now that they're publicly traded, they are core civic is now able to basically get in the political reign uh, or the political game. So now they are incentivized to lobby for legislation that allows for them to have even more control over the sec uh, over the prison sector. And which that has been shown to be doing, um, if you look back at their donating funds, they donate a lot to Republican senators. They donate, uh, they know, donated to the Trump campaign when he was running in 2015 and in 2020. Um, they constantly are around um, to facilitate di different lobbying tactics and stuff. Although they'll say they haven't and they will say that they don't um, do that, but they absolutely do. And in their statements recently with the Joe Biden um, uh, 
uh, Joe Biden announcing that private prisons don't have a place with federal government. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, they have changed their tone and said, oh, they're, oh, we're about rehabilitation now and we're about this and this and this. When that doesn't make sense because that's not part of their business model because private prisons are a business model. It is the intersection between capitalism and incarceration, period. Mm -hmm. So it makes no sense when they're like, yes, we don't, we actually don't even want to be a company anymore. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I hope that gave a better structural understanding of what private prisons look like. And it was very long winded. <laughs> no, I think it was perfect because it's really hard. I mean, it's a very complex system to even explain i think you made it uh, very digestible for people who are just um even just tuning in to learn about it but the other thing also to know is even with the public sector um in regards to like cleaning cleaning tasks or making beds or mm -hmm. making oftentimes those who are incarcerated have to do those jobs um and the state would be saving money by giving those who are incarcerated those tasks because necessarily they don't have to pay them and if they do it's way below minimum wage i mean like sometimes pennies dollars an hour and most of the, time, the money they actually do make will go to the commissionary where they need to buy products like soap or tampons or these necessary yeah. things so you're just recycling the money back again so not a lot of profit from at least those who are incarcerated is being made and even for the private sector as you mentioned a lot of these companies will be pitching to even legislators saying you know um we can save um taxpayers money and yep. then also go in the political realm where people are saying oh i'm going to be reducing taxes and when you look a little bit deeper sometimes yep. that's working with these facilities um and it's all there's multiple sectors that's one thing about um the campaign that we have at freedom united is we're asking for divestment from the public and private because both sectors are also benefiting from this yes and there's a lot of different programs and what we've seen and we've also engaged in is a lot of campaigns to appeal and amend the 13th amendment that would abolish um, slavery as a tool of punishment, but that's just one method. Uh, but you're right. still have st who have um, been amending their legislation, but it still doesn't fix the fact of compensation um, because a lot of the time, a lot of companies will say is those who are incarcerated are technically not employees so they're not even given the same wages so it goes in a lot deeper and since the private sector has been involved it's made it a lot worse for people to get um compensation and i think one model that i always say is the fact that this the current the incarceration system and the judicial the criminal justice system has created a system like human trafficking where individuals are put in a place where they're vulnerable um so if somebody's incarcerated and they come out um they didn't make money let's say now california just overturned um that legislation where individuals can enlist be firefighters as we saw but before they couldn't so let's say you have 10 years of experience of being incarcerated and doing this type of work and then you get out and you didn't make any money from all right. those years that again you're going out and you have a criminal record so you cannot get employment um for certain places and mm -hmm. you, have, you have nothing to start off and sometimes you have to especially now dealing with the pandemic and how the economy is you're put in a place where you have to survive and fend for yourself in a system and sometimes that leads you back into the same circumstances that you were you were facing before you got incarcerated so you go back into the prison system again and that's yep. exactly trafficking works in regards to yep. making individual um and coercing them into um exploitation and i think uh it, it happens before us and as you mentioned i think a lot of us are um do benefit from this uh, this system of forced labor in regards to prison slavery and um it's really hard to tackle in where it's coming from and if you look into some companies it's even universities with be better belmont you'll see the supply chains leading you back to these companies mm -hmm. um one thing to echo as well at freedom united and uh, with be better belmont we reached out to hbcus that have a contract with aramark um and as we mentioned aramark is a food vending company um and they do use um 
prison labor for their supply chains. Um, and we're asking for historically black colleges to cut their ties from Aramark. Um, and a lot of times what companies who benefit from the system um, always say is, you know, we're not in charge of the legal system, so we can't, it's the, how the system works. We're trying to be part of the rehabilitation and providing uh, proper working conditions. But one thing that we want to echo is if you genuinely want to support the incarcerated community, you need to pay them the, the same wages you and I would be paid if we weren't incarcerated. Individuals who are incarcerated should also be getting it. And if you are joining a system and benefiting from the prison system, which you already know is complicit with prison slavery, then you're already part of the problem. Um, and that's right. what echoing a lot um, for our campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so I have one more question from our end before we open it up to our audience, because I know we're running a little bit short on time, is what can viewers do um, to fight against uh, prison slavery? If you can, I know you spoke a little bit about the five actions, be better, but my cause, but um, what can cons consumers do? What can I do? What can our viewers do? Yeah, um, I think the first thing to do for me was just to... Um, I just wanted to get educated, honestly. Um, I, if I was, when I was started to get interested in abolition work, I just started reading about the places that I, uh, well, abolition in general, but just reading about the places that I patron a lot um, and seeing like, okay, do they have supply chain connections? Where, where is uh, the prison industry hiding in my everyday life? Um, and finding those areas and, Granted, depending on what the, where that shows up in your everyday life, you can either just stop patronizing these certain areas or you can do as uh, the group of us did and call on like an institution like Belmont University. Our, our whole coalition is made up of alumni members, community, Nashville community members and current students um, who are all tired of dealing or of having this um connection to the prison industry complex as to a university that claims like diversity and wholesomeness and christian ethics and all that so we took it upon ourselves to call that, that out um, and luckily we have been able to raise a lot of awareness on the belmont community side of just like current students and incoming students who didn't know anything about this but also nashville grassroots community members as well who are doing other work um, there are some really great grassroots organizations like Gideon's Army, Free Hearts, Path, uh, Never Again, all these places that we have been able to join with as well and learn from each other and create networks um, to each other um, and calling for abolition and calling for different social justice networks. So I would get first get plugged into just or checking in with what your day-to-day -day actions look like and how they may or may not be affected or beneficiary off of the industrial complex, prison industrial complex, and then looking to your community and looking to what work is already being done. And if there isn't, start the work. Um, join and um, bring in, uh, in coalitioning with other people, um, with your community and learning what your community needs are and trying to work towards those. And I really love how you said if the work is still there, um, to just start organizing and going for it. And that's what Be Better Vermont kind of started off with is an alumni and students that came together um, and saw a gap and it, you chose to advocate for the community that they're a part of. Um, and for our end on some things that individuals could do is also sign on to our petition. As I mentioned, uh, we've partnered with Be Better Belmont and we've had different strategies on how to eradicate prison slavery. We're asking for individuals and companies to divest from the system and also asking for legislative change. So you actually can go to our bio here at Freedom United and sign our petition. It could take you less than five seconds to add your name. And you also get updates on our campaign and what we're working on. Um, as I said, currently now, we are asking for HBCUs, historically black colleges, to divest from Aramark, um, the company that we just mentioned that uses prison slavery. And also for those who are tuning in, if you see, uh, if you have any campaigns or just know any companies that are complicit in this or systems, um, please send us um, information at Freedom United um, and we're working on this campaign, both of us here on this slide.
where you get to see the faces behind the campaign that we're working on but we're always looking for different strategies to tackle this beast because there's not one way of solving uh, prison slavery because again it is so deeply rooted um just to even explain like her, like i don't even know how to describe it and like there are so the, many <laughs> so many ways there's so many different levels of how the system has built about it that it's going to take um a big beast beyond legislation it's going to be a cultural shift so if there's any work or mobilization that's happening um please send it to us at info at freedomunited.org as well um and we would love to hear from you guys. Um, so let me quickly check in on any questions we have sent. If anybody has sent, let me take a look over here. We got one from Emily. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the products that are being made in prison rather than private ownership of prisons or any corporations using these have made statements or responded to criticism? Um, I know we spoke about Aramark. I know that's one that I can think of on top of my head. Uh, but I know there's a lot of companies that also use a lot of fast fashion. Yeah. Oh. Okay, gotcha. uh, yeah, so I think one that really, sh there's there are a lot. There's 4,300 companies in the U.S. that use prison labor to some extent, whether that's through food distribution like Sodexo and Airmark, or if it's through companies like... Um, um, I want to say, so JCPenney was one that was huge, um, and uh, Macy's was one. Old Navy, I want to say, was one as well. There are cosmetic, well-known cosmetic brands that also use prison labor. Um, many uh, different, like, hotel services are somehow, or different entanglements with prison, with private prisons. Um, as, like, we saw in Texas and the border, there were, um, I, I want to say, I don't want to be mis- the, or drag holiday in through the mud but um there are different hotel services that have been used as uh, to harbor children that are migrant children that are being deported um and so i think um there what but the story that really um really affected me reading and learning about it was my friend tamaria who's a an educational farmer she was telling me about um human trafficking of um uh, of immigrants that are coming in and they will use uh, immigrants who are looking for papers or wanting to get citizenship and they'll bring them to poultry farms um, and they will hold all of their registrations, they will hold all of their paperwork and have them work under minimum wages um, and like pennies, pennies to the dollar essentially. Um, in poor working conditions for probably 18 hours a day, something, something, something along the lines of that. Um, and when people try to leave or people try to get their papers back so that they can go to a different company or something, um, those business, those, uh, their managers, super supervisors, whoever is in charge of them, um, will simply lose the paperwork and then they will report them and then they will be deported and they won't be able to return to the country. Um, so you see things like that where it's just purely a system of human trafficking using them for labor and then kicking them back to wherever they are immigrating from or whatever. Um, and that is what really troubled me is that that's our poultry system and that uh, companies like Tyson, companies like all, um, uh, whatever, Purdue, who use exploitative la labor for their food distribution. And that's just, that's something we eat every day um, if you are a meat eating person. And so that to me is what strikes me is something that I'm putting in my body is complicit in um, exploiting people who are just trying to find safety or just trying to find solace um, away from something that they're trying to escape, which is just uh, disgusting. And this kind of ties in perfectly with the question that just popped up on here it's, as well as what happens if those who are incarcerated re refuse to do work? Are there any unions or bodies that represent the rights um, of those who are incarcerated? And I think that's one thing about um, the prison system that I just mentioned is the fact that a lot of these companies or industries do not legally um, do not 
view them as employees, even though they are doing the work of what an employee outside of the incarceration system would be doing. So a lot of representations or rights is very limited. And again, it goes back into that 13th Amendment where it is technically legal in the United States to exploit labor. So there's no, um, the, the, the rights are very tricky um, in regards to that. I know when it comes to private the compensation is a little bit more different, but there's again programs where um, individuals, can, I mean, the the county who contracted with the private companies could take about eighty percent of their wages um, to pay for their housing, food. So again, it's being refurnished back to the system. So again, um, it's very tricky. Uh, and in regards to the support, I know there's a lot of organizing that are trying to unionize um, inmates who are working. But again, when it comes to the legal system, the t their hands sometimes get tied on what rights are given. Uh, but this is also a bigger issue outside of human trafficking, but it, the rights of those who are um, incarcerated in regards to what they can actually have during and after incarceration is mm -hmm. very, very um, in the United States and again falls back into a lot of laborers being uh, recruited back into the prison system and again essentially being human trafficked back into the um, prison slavery. Uh, but I don't know if there's anything else you want to expand on that in regards to the rights and unionization of uh, those who are incarcerated. I think um, all, I, all I would add to that is that um, since the kind of birth of privatized uh, prisons from the 80s, there has been a consistent level of like um, prison workers um, kind of uprisings. There has been a history of inmates um, unionizing themselves and mobilizing themselves. Some of them have made differences and some of them really have made um, a point that in different public and private facilities that they are their treatment has not been act or has not been of like a human dignity level, um, especially workers who were um, putting out California fires. Um, who not this not this last time around, but the one before. So not in 2019, but the ones earlier. Um, there was a huge wave of um, grassroots organizers who would communicate with workers from um, prison laborers inside. Um, and there are different, there are just, there are different grassroots organizations that are trying to connect with them. Um, but like you said, the legalities of it and just the, the ability to fall back on the 13th Amendment and using um, this kind of labor under crime punishment thing, um, that it is really difficult to unionize per se, because they're not seen as employees, they're seen as working through their punishment or whatever however fun, fun way they want to rephrase that um yeah so it is very difficult and i think one thing to also acknowledge is in regards to at least with um immigration detention centers um what we've seen is these because technically under the 13th amendment as well those who are within detention facilities are not incarcerated um so they can't fall back on that legislation. However, they'll have programs like voluntary work programs. But what that voluntary means is that there's areas of coercion. And what we've seen in mm -hmm. some patients is when individuals refuse to work and say, I don't want to work, they, there will be some sort of punishment or the guards will scare them or tell them like, oh, you're you'll be here longer or you can't leave and scaring them into doing work. And that's where that human trafficking angle in with coercion. Um, and one of the mis biggest misconception with human trafficking is you have to go from point A to point B to be trafficked. Um, but the, the biggest, mm. um, and that's where we see it within um, ICE facilities, which we actually have another campaign um, directly with Core Civic speaking about this issue. Um, so when you're going in to take action um, on this campaign, there's two places you could go. We have one directly speaking about prison slavery and then another one calling out um, ICE facilities and detention centers as well. So you could be looping on both of those campaigns um, if you wanna take action for both. I think we've answered all of our questions here. I'm not sure if there's anything else at the bottom. 
much to do. But um, again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free um, to contact us. You can also send us messages on our DMs as well, also via email. Um, and then again, the link to our bio as well can direct you to our campaigns that I just mentioned. Um, but thank you all for tuning in. Thank you so much, Safara, for coming in as well. Um, and I hope everybody was able to, to learn a little bit more about sleep, prison slavery during this live. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. I'll speak to you soon. Bye, everyone. Cool. Bye.